Welcome. Uh, my name is Brad Hunt. I'm the Vice President for Research and Academic Programs at the Newberry Library. And I'd like to welcome everyone to the Urban History Seminar here at the Chicago History Museum. I am one of the seminar's organizers, along with Michael Ebner, Ann Keating, and Russell Lewis. Tonight is the last session of our 34th season, and the Urban History Seminar will continue next fall with its 35th season. Our lineup is nearly finished, and we're going to bring groundbreaking work in urban history as well as new understandings of Chicago to our audiences. But tonight I am delighted to introduce our speaker, Dr. Patricia American Norby, who is a colleague and a friend. Patricia is a member of the Pudachapa. Did I pronounce that correctly? Close. Yes, close enough. I hope you'll correct me. Uh, a member of the Pudachapa community and is the director of the Darcy McNichol Center for American Indian and Indigenous Studies at the Newberry Library, which recently celebrated its 45th anniversary. She leads a dynamic research and program center that brings together scholars of the American Indian experience, it trains graduate students in indigenous studies methods, and it produces terrific programming that consistently draws large crowds to the Newberry. In this month alone, she will be organizing not only one, but two scholarly symposiums, one on violence in indigenous communities, and the second on indigeneity, gender, and sexualities. Last year, her McNichol Center and the Newberry Library received the 2016 International Guardians of Culture and Lifeways Award for Archives Institutional Excellence from the Association of Tribal Archives, Libraries, and Museums. And this is the most important organization in the field, and that's a real testimony to Dr. Norby's leadership. Before coming to the Newberry, she was on the faculty at the University of Wisconsin, and she earned her PhD in American Studies from the University of Minnesota. She also holds a Master of Fine Arts degree from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and a Museum Studies Certificate from Northwestern University. She has published in the William & Mary Quarterly, the American Indian Culture and Research Journal, and she is completing a book manuscript for the Museum of New Mexico Press entitled Water, Bones, and Bombs, Three Artists and the Fight for Northern New Mexico. Patricia has done ex exhibition and curatorial research for the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian, and she currently sits on the board of the Field Museum for Natural History here in Chicago, where she serves on the exhibition and deaccession committees. She's been an active member of the Chicago American Indian Community Collaborative, which serves the, serves the needs of Chicago American Indians. The title of her talk tonight is Indigenous Metropolis, Chicago's Urban Indians. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Patricia American Norby. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. There's always that moment when someone's introducing you that you think, or at least for me, this, is that really me that they're talking about? It just doesn't seem like it. Um, before I begin, of course, I'd like to offer my thanks. Um, it was a wonderful dinner and conversation, and I'm, I'm really pleased to be here this evening. But I do want to say um, a special thank you to Michael and Daryl Ebner, and also Ann Keating, and um, to Brad Hunt for inviting me to, to speak tonight and to share this local history with you. Um, I'd like to begin by saying that we are gathered tonight on what is considered traditionally Potawatomi territory. But I also want to acknowledge our contemporary American Indian communities, including the Ho-Chunk, Menominee, Lakota, Dakota, and the Miao Miao, or Miami people, who also refer to this place as home, this very special place that we call Chicago. And so I'll begin. <clears throat> I'm going to begin with a story. I don't know where to aim this here. There we go. <laughs> On January 13th, 1923, the Chicago Daily Tribune highlighted a rare visit from 12 members of a Pueblo Indian delegation. The article read, waving war plumes and sipping demitasse, jingling with ancestral wrought silver 
bangles and smart with modern tie clips, wrapped in ancient tribal blankets, and talking learnedly of legislation, medical surveys, and agriculture, 12 Pueblo Indians yesterday invaded the Chicago Women's Club and, Quif and Cliff Dwellers. In the eyes of Chicago society, the Pueblo group embodied at once both rugged primitiveness with their ancestral bangles and ancient tribal blankets, and, and also refined sophistication, sipping demitas in tiny white cups while chatting up members of Chicago's leading civic and fine arts clubs. The visit would cause quite a stir, according to the artist Ralph Fletcher Seymour, and these are his words. Pandemonium slept, swept through the building. The news that a tribe of Western Indians in full costume had come to the cliff dwellers spread through the neighborhood and then to the newspapers. The elevator men abandoned their cars. Waiters gave up their responsibilities of serving tables. Tables were upset. Bank presidents climbed on chairs. Broken dishes cluttered the floor. And spectators crowded into impen impenetrable masses about the performers as they rendered their corn dance for their cliff dweller brothers. The Pueblo's Midwestern visit was a timely one, and in some ways, and in some ways not at all surprising. The social and political connections between members of New Mexico's artist communities and Santa Fe and Taos ran deep among Chicago notables and social organizations. <clears throat> For instance, the General Federation of Women's Clubs local um, vice president, Anna Ix, was the, was the local chapter representative, and she was instrumental in organizing this Midwest visit. The Pueblos made an impression on the urban socialites and local political leaders, including former Chicago mayor Carter Harrison Jr., who regularly vacationed in New Mexico and considered himself a Southwestern aficionado. There was also the attorney Harold Ix, husband of Anna, who would later serve 13 years as U.S. Secretary of the Interior under Roosevelt and Truman administrations. Also present at the Pueblo reception was the prominent artist and author, Ralph Fletcher Seymour. For Seymour, the delegation visit held particularly special meaning. He had designed the Cliff Dwellers Club's official logo, a quasi-Pueblo graphic that was featured on the club's stationery, glassware, yearbooks, and menus. Seymour also co-led the Chicago Indian Rights Association as secretary with Anna Ix as treasurer and Carter Harrison as chairman. The Pueblo delegation's reception was hosted at the Cliff Dwellers Club headquarters, also known as the Kiva. This elite urban organization which celebrated American literature, culture, and fine arts was known for the deep affinity for all things Indian. In 1909, the club's inauguration featured a fire lighting ceremony, peace pipe, drumming, and chanting of the phrase, we come from Sipapu, we come, we come. The club's enthusiasm over the Pueblo Group's 1923 arrival in Chicago spread quickly. The visit was featured in local papers and on radio talk shows, with everything from the Indians' eating habits to their dress, bodily adornment, oops, and sleeping habits all carefully noted. Although to some of the Pueblo, to some, the Pueblo's visit to Chicago might seem unusual to Indian people, a long distance visit from an Indian delegation was not unusual at all. Chicago had always been an urban Indian metropolis, attracting Indian and other indigenous communities from as far away from as Mexico as early as the 16th century. In the words of one of our local community elders, she states, Chicago has always been Indian country and Indians have always been urban. Oh, I should go back. So this is the January 19th, or January 20, or 13th, 1923 image of um, the Pueblo delegation in downtown Chicago. And their visit did cause quite a stir as they were, they were headed from New Mexico through Chicago and made other visits all the way to Washington, D.C., where they were defending a bill at that time 
um, to protect their lands in New Mexico. And so they were, they were going around visiting many urban centers in order to garner support for their, um, for their political actions. So Indians have always been urban. Consider, for instance, that most of our major cities in the Americas are built upon what have always been indigenous urban centers. And this is a 1525 map from the Newberg collection of Tenochtitlan. And what I want for you to notice about this particular map is that the city is built around water or inside water. So water is key to where all of these metropolises are built. These cities are always strategically located near lakes, rivers, wetlands, and other natural resources. Also, the word Chicago, as many of you know, is an Algonquian term. And there's many meanings attributed to this, to this word. Some people say that it means wild onion, other people say that it means skunk smell or stinky water, but I think that all of these references are alluding to the fertility of this area, the lush green, greenness, the fertile soils, um, the swamps, all of these things are all the major waterways that are here. All of these things are what made this a particularly strong area for indigenous communities, not only to settle, but also to move through. And one of my favorite exhibits is actually right upstairs in the diorama room of this museum. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it talks about that here in Chicago, while most of the city is built on a north, um, north south, east, west grid, there are interesting rows that cut across the city that don't quite fit into the city plan. Clark Street, I think, is one. I'm, there are others. And those are the original indigenous roadways um, for this area. And I love to think about that, because I think Indians were so, are so incredibly smart to build their cities and you know, their spaces of living near water, near all these natural resources, and then to build these roads that cut straight across to where they want to go. There is no doubt that by 1837, Native peoples had already set the blueprint for Chicago as an urban space. So these are, this is um, also in the Newberry collection, um, the Indian settlement pattern um, in this area. And as you can see, it's quite heavy. And it's all around, out, around the water, um, along you know, with the Fox River, the Splains River, Mississippi River, all of these water resources, and, all, and the wetlands all around here. Um, so I'm thinking about, in particular, the, um, the corridor that's down by the Field Museum, which they're now turning back into a uh, natural habitat with native grasses and all of those um, wonderful um, plants over there. All of these things are what attracted native people here. So evidence of this is not only found in our local historical archives, but also in our, the very neighborhoods where we live today. Roadways, tree markers, and earthworks are all testament to regional indigenous urban centers. And for example, Leakin Park had once, once did have Indian mounds and graves. And I think when you walk through Lincoln Park, there's actually a marker there that says, this is where there were Indian mounds. Um, so, that also. And then also, this is interesting. This is in the Newberry um, collection. It's Edward Clark's uh, celebration of the centennial of Chicago. And it's entitled Indian Encampment, Lincoln Park, 1903. Although it doesn't seem quite like to be a centennial celebration. It's a little off in terms, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a, right. Um, it's 30 years off, but he is celebrating um, the Indian presence here um, in Lincoln Park. And I just wanted to read a little bit about, about what he says and what he writes. Indian Encampment, 1903. 
If you would know the Chicago of a century year ago, a century ago, look about you. The dead past lie, lives anew in this Indian village. Forget the great throbbing city which lies just beyond. And here, amid these wigwams, people by a strange race find the picture condition of conditions existing before the white man and his civilization came to this Lake Michigan shore. These men, these women and children, these huts and these implements of war and the chase are the same today as on that yesterday of a century ago. These Indians, the Potawatomis, the Winnebagos, and their brothers of other tribes are here camped, probably for the last time, on the ground once held by their fa fathers by inherent right. So it's a declension narrative, as we all know, the fantasy of Indians disappearing. Um, and it's written in that language. But I guess my point, in, point is we never disappeared. We're still here, and we're 35,000 to 40,000 people strong <laughs> right here in Chicago. And so that's what I'm trying to emphasize right now. One popular misconception is that American Indians first came to Chicago during the Indian Relocation Act of 1956 or the pub or public law um, 959. This law encouraged Native Americans to leave reservations, acquire vocational skills, and to assimilate into the general population. Part of the, this was part of the Indian termination policy, and both laws sought to terminate tri tribal status and grew, population, grew the populations of urban Indians. So major cities were all bringing Native people to them, um, Minnesota, other places, or Minneapolis, other places. Um, so there's this, there's this misconception that Indians did not come to Chicago until the 1950s, and that's just not the case. I think what was going on was that because there was this influx of Native people from reservations, there was this type of renaissance of Native culture during that time period. So there was a lot of stuff going on. And so there's a lot of romanticizing about this specific time period and Indian communities in Chicago. So what you're looking at is a flyer from the, one of the Indian powwows of 1958, which follows just after the Relocation Act. But also, what's interesting about this is that this particular flyer lists the American Indian Center on 411 North LaSalle. And as you know, the Chicago American Indian Center was there, and then it moved over to Wilson Avenue, where it remained for, what, 40 years? And then it's now moved again, just recently. And I'm glad to know that, because it was a moment where they had to decide. The building was falling down. It was from the 1920s, although it had beautiful murals, and they had really adapted what was originally a Masonic temple from the 1920s into their own space. It, every year, the boiler was breaking down. The space was just an unhealthy space. There was asbestos, all types of issues. And finally, the in Indian community said, it's time to go. And they embraced the moment. They sold what was prime real estate, and now they found a place, and I'm so happy for this, with a great parking space. <laughs> so um, now we can all attend the powwow with, um, with a place to park our cars. <clears throat> the re relocation program provided initial employment for heads of family, though retaining a new job while coping with the trauma of displacement could be difficult and financial assist assistance for one year. So that's what you were provided, a new job and financial assistance for one year, after which the process of adjusting to urban life was considered complete. With few resources to ease this transition, other institutions in Chicago soon emerged to foster social cohesion among urban Indian communities. One of these institutions was the Chicago American Indian Center, the con this country's oldest urban Indian center. Another was St. Augustine's Indian Center, founded in 1961 by Father Peter Powell. And I'm going to quote Father Powell. He says, throughout the Eisenhower administration, relocation was considered to be the major panacea for American Indian social and economic ills. 
This is what he wrote in a 1998 report for the Newberry Library. I witnessed the increasing numbers of families being brought here by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, then dropped with inadequate follow-up. As relocation went on unabated under President Eisenhower, Chicago American Indian, the Chicago American Indian population grew exponentially. Over time, it cohered into a vibrant community built around native traditions as well as the organi organizing principles of resilience, endurance, sovereignty, and sovereignty in the face of adversity. At the same time, the community embraced new political, a new political consciousness that was energizing marginalized groups across American society. In the, in the 1960s, and urban Indians organized to protest unjust government policies. So what you're looking at are photographs from the Chicago American Indian community that are now part of the Newberry Library collection. Um, we're slowly building up our urban Indian community collection. Most of our materials are from the um, 16th century through 19th century regarding indigenous communities um, hemispherically. But then now, with the move, the Chicago American Indian move um, and storage issues, the Newberry is now building up our 20th through 21st century materials, including tapes of oral histories, photographs, all of these kinds of things that are, are being kept at the Newberry. And I love these photographs. The top one on the left is the Canoe Club in the 1960s, and you can see they're canoeing on Lake Michigan. Uh, the top right is obviously a powwow, some type of gathering. There are people cooking um, for that event. On the, bottom, on the bottom left, that's Father Peter Powell talking with a community member. Father Peter Powell is also on the top, wearing the sunglasses in the middle of the canoe. Yes. And then there are two women, two women right in the Newberry Library um, at an, an event held there. Um, Father Peter Powell is now in his 80s, um, late 80s. He is still going strong. He recently won an award for a book on Cheyenne history. And he now has a new office. St. Augustine's just closed down. Um, Last, last year, right? Just about a few months ago. And so we gave him an office at the Newberry. And so he works at the Darcy McNichol Center almost every day. And he's there working hard on a new book project. The American Indian Chicago Conference of 1961 was convened at the University of Chicago by Darcy McNichol and Saul Tax, chair of the anthropology department at at U of C, bringing together tribal representatives in numbers never, was never before attainable. And this conference became, in effect, the major Indian voice that awakened the public to the threat of American Indian sovereignty posed by termination, said Father Peter Powell. The conference foreshadowed the emergence of American Indian studies as an academic discipline in the 1970s when American Indians would receive greater institutional support in order to bring their own perspectives to bear on Ameri American historiography. And this is a beautiful photograph of Linda Benson taken by Ben Bearskin. It's now in the collection at the Newberry. And I love the contrast of her traditional outfit with the urban skyline. I'm going to transition here to the Newberry Library and talk a little bit about our American Indian collection and how it came to be. The Newberry was founded in July of 1887 and opened in September of that year. Chicago businessman Walter Newberry bequeathed $2.2 million for the foundation of a free public library north of Chicago, the Chicago River. In 1893, the Newberry found its permanent home on the southwest corners of Clark Street and Walton in what is called uh, Washington Square Park. In 1972, at the Newberry, the Darcy McNichol Center opened with a blessing ceremony for, from the Chicago American Indian community. Today, we work with hundreds of scholars, teachers, writers, and indigenous community members in their research, which is grounded in American Indian and indigenous perspectives and archival research. Created according to the vision of the Salish Kootenai scholar, novelist, and political activist Darcy McNichol, along with Lawrence Towner, director of the Newberry Library, they submitted 
to the National Endowment for the Humanities a grant application with the purpose of establishing a center for the history of the American Indian at the Newberry. And part of the grant application included the following phrase. By offering financial support and making research materials available, the center will encourage doctoral candidates to become specialists in the history of the American Indian. The goal will be to increase significantly the number of qualified specialists in the United States, especially among Indians themselves. The McNichol Center has always centered on indigenous perspectives of the Newberry's American Indian materials. And now that's very different from a non-Indian perspective looking at American Indian materials, and I'll explain why. But first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our collection. The Edward E. Eyre, um, Edward E. Eyre was a Wisconsin and Chicago lumberman and bibliophile, and he was an original trustee of the Newberry Library. He was born in 1841 in Kenosha, Wisconsin, to parents who had, be, who had come in 1836 from New England. In 1855, the Eyre family settled in Harvard, Illinois, and at age 18, Edward Eyre left for California where he worked in lumbering until he enlisted in 1861 in the 1st California Cavalry. During his service with the California Cavalry and while marching in Arizona and New Mexico, Eyre interacted with Mexican Indian and American Indian communities, which led him to read Prescott's History of Mexico. And then it was there that he started his long-term fascination with everything pertaining to indigenous peoples. Eyre grew his own wealth, thriving in the railroad tie business, supplying Chicago and Northwestern railroads, and quickly expanding to include contracts across the country with Union Pacific and other railroads. The young lumber baron collected matchless documentation of American Indian culture and history, European settlement, and interaction between American Indians and Europeans. He, he collected in all formats, including printed books, maps, atlases, manuscripts, photographs, and artwork. By the end of the century, with the Spanish-American War, Eyre added the Philippines and Hawaii to his collecting scope. He also hired transcribers to copy thousands of pages of original documents in Spanish and Mexican archives. Eyre's formal gift to the Newberry occurred in 1911 and included 33,407 items. Such manuscripts, artworks, and such as manuscripts, artworks, and photographs, Eyre actively added to it until his death in 1927 and endowed his collection so that it would grow continuously. So I can't even imagine where he would keep 33,407 um, items. Um, but he did live right in downtown, and I think it was called Banks. Is it called Banks Street, which is right over here? And his home is torn down, but we do have some of architectural pieces from his original home at the Newberry. So I like to joke about his love of American materials. Now, or we call them collectors, but I think, I think more contemporary audiences might call them hoarders. <laughs> I like to think of him as a hoarder. So, our collection now includes 130,000 volumes, 1 million manuscript pages, 2,000 maps, 500 atlases, 11,000 photographs, 3,500 drawing and paintings, and 4,000 items in and about indigenous languages at the hemispheric level. And this is the number that, that we had three years ago. I should update it. but. It's actually bigger than that now because we are now at, we're collecting, as I said, more 20th and 21st century materials. We now have a native comic book collection, postcard collection, um, film collection. So we're really bringing in a lot more materials. Scholars want this. Younger scholars are interested in this type of archival material. And so we've really grown the collection in just the past few years. Working with indigenous historical materials requires an intuitive understanding and respect for the very personal and sometimes sacred meaning that these materials hold for indigenous communities from whom they originate. 
at the Newberry, the archive com becomes, comes alive when American Indian and other indigenous groups visit and work with the collection items that are relevant to their communities and families. During these very personalized visits, it is not uncommon for emotions to run high with people experiencing a wide range of emotions from joy and excitement to deep sadness and anger over materials that reflect their communal histories. However, these visits are also rich with reciprocity and learning and sharing viewpoints between American Indian scholars and visitors and our library staff. So we learn a lot by Native people coming to our archive, working with them. They teach us a great deal. And this, is, um, this was an interesting visit with Chief Glenna Wallace and members of the Eastern Shawnee Nation. They spent a week at the Newberry going through materials from their community um, under the Hermione um, Wheeler Vogelin collection. And it was really an amazing visit because Chief Glenna Wallace was finding materials about her own family, um, adoption records, all kinds of things, names of relatives and other community members that they had not known before. And as you can imagine, it was quite emotional. And these kinds of visits grow our staff. They learn to, to work with Native people in a, in a level that they have not worked with a typical researcher. So for instance, Every four years, the um, Kiche community comes from Guatemala, and they hold a sacred ceremony with the Popol Vuh. And this one was from um, two, um, 2015. Their ceremonies involve fire, water, flower petals, chanting. And as you can imagine, our conservationists cringe every four years <laughs> when we have this visit. But I think that it's really opening up our staff. A sense of flexibility is also critical since Native visitors want to hold ceremonies or document personal interactions with specific collection items. Conservation requirements and viewing restrictions often come into play during these visits. Hosting American Indian and other indigenous delegation urges the typical scholar, librarian, and archivist to think outside the traditional archival box. Language thinking visually and material, materially, and understanding that many of our materials have direct personal connections to these individuals. As scholars working with indigenous histories and materials, we believe it is critical to maintain a level of vigilance that does not allow us to get too comfortable with indigenous materials being housed in what are traditionally colonial institutions. We're always aware of this, and we're aware that these are materials that were brought here because of the process of colonization. Going back to Clark's, um, was it 1903 <laughs> celebration, his centennial celebration, Indians were disappearing. And so we have to collect as much stuff as we can before they're all gone. That was the premise by which, or on which, Air collected these materials and how they came to the Newberry. This is one of my favorite um, series of photographs. It's our president, David Spadafora, receiving a blessing ceremony from a K'iche' medicine man. There were a group of staff that work with, with the Popol Vuh regularly and with indigenous communities, and the K'iche' community wanted to honor our group and offer us blessings and also a ceremony of protection. During that ceremony, we had to make a promise to always protect the Popol Vuh and to ensure that it would always be kept safe for future K'iche' generations. And we take that promise very seriously. A lot of times people want to talk about the conflict of having indigenous materials in a colonial institution and the type of the paradox or that contradiction there. Some people say these things need to be returned to the community. And I agree to that, I agree with that to a certain level, serving on the deaccession committee at the Field Museum. However, there are moments, like with the K'iche' people, when they came to us and said, never, never let the Popol Vuh go. If you allow it to go back to Guatemala, it will be destroyed. And the indigenous people there will never be able to read this sacred text. 
So there are certain times when we have to honor that and what they say, and we take our promise very seriously to protect those documents. As a scholar and as an indigenous woman and as someone who every year works to support young scholars and in indigenous research methods, the relevancy of archives does not always lie in the material value of individual collection items, but rather in the intersections that archival materials hold and the myriad of indigenous perspectives with which the archive can be approached. Nowhere is this tension the contradictions between archives and indigenous communities more obvious than in the personal stories and connections between indigenous people and these items. Today the McNichol Center, at the McNichol Center, our work remains grounded in the original vision of a scholarly center that prioritizes indigenous perspectives. And over the past 45 years, that commitment has only deepened to include programming, both public and scholarly, that aligns with the original mission um, of Darcy McNichol. And I just wanted to read it. Our mission involves encourage the use of the Newberry collections on American Indian history, improve the quality of what is written about American Indians, educate teachers and the general public about American Indian culture, history, and literature, assist American Indian tribal historians in their research, and provide a meeting ground where scholars, teachers, tribal historians, and others interested in American Indian studies can discuss their work with each other. Thank you. <laughs>